Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the next in the series of NCR's coronavirus briefings, as we call them. But this one is very much on the macroeconomy and what we should expect from the budget that will be uh, announced and uh, read out in the budget speech in a few days' time on the 1st of February by the Honorable Finance Minister. My name is Shekhar Shah. I'm the Director General of NCEA, and we have a distinguished panel uh, who will be talking to the issues that uh, confront uh, us, the economy, uh, and of course, the Minister of Finance, uh, as she uh, will have crafted a very delicate budget with uh, lots of balancing to be done between uh, support for accelerated and sustained recovery uh, while maintaining uh, a strong emphasis on fiscal discipline and, of course, the headline deficit. And that's going to be very much, I suspect, the theme of today's discussion. But we want to go beyond that and look at also medium term issues and issues in specific sectors. And I'm delighted to have a distinguished panel that can cover all of these uh, elements. Uh, so with us, uh, and let me introduce them, uh, is Usha Thorat, uh, former deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And as you might expect, she's going to drill down into what ails our financial sector and what should be done uh, about that. And we really look forward to her views on that. Um, we have with us as well uh, Sonal Verma uh, at Nomura. Uh, Sonal is at the moment in Singapore. And thank you for, uh, this is a late hour for you. Uh, grateful for your participation, Sonal. She's been on our uh, webinars in the past and has always come up with very interesting views and thoughts on um, what uh, yeah, might uh, be in, uh, uh, in, in front of us. And just today, I think she's put out a very interesting uh, piece on how we will have some headwinds, uh, 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 sorry, so, sort of uh, winds from the back, whatever they're called, uh, 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 pushing us uh, with global trade picking up. Uh, and so we look forward very much to that. Uh, Sajid Chinoy, Chief Economist of JP Morgan, situated in Mumbai, also a familiar face on our webinars, um, also a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, uh, so really delighted to have you, Sajid, with us. And then uh, very much uh, our own distinguished fellow uh, at NCER, Shudipto Mandal, uh, who uh, has been here both in as a panelist, but also as an author of our key work that we do, which is the quarterly review of the Indian economy. And uh, very fortunately, we have our other team member who is helping me Dr. Bonali Bhandari also, uh, whose uh, at least name you can see. So with that introduction, let me go right into um, our webinar. Um, and uh, let's ask Sajid Chinoy first to give us his overall sense, both of the external environment that India faces, um, and then of course, the impetus and the drivers of growth, as well as what he sees to be uh, the key challenges the finance minister will face. And uh, I'm not going to reveal uh, a most interesting article he's just written today. And I'm sure he's going to talk about that. Sajid. Uh, thank you very much, Ekar. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Um, so as you said, let me just start with the global backdrop and understand some of the, the lay of the land as we as we're going to the budget. You know, the good news is that um, the hole that we were in globally is perhaps less deep uh, than we once thought. The IMF put out its... Uh, economic update uh, a couple of days ago, and they now project that in 2020, the contraction will be about 3.5% globally compared to almost 4.5% six months ago. This is still huge. This is the largest contraction since the Great Depression, but less acute than we thought. And they've again marked up their 2021 growth forecast. So the good news is that you know uh, growth prospects are looking better than they were three months ago or six months ago. We've made record progress on the vaccine every day. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are getting vaccinated. That's the good news. I think the the the, the challenges that we face or the areas we need to be vigilant about. Um, you know, when we look at these numbers, minus four one year and plus five the next, or you know, minus eight one year and plus twelve the next. How do you make sense of the recovery? And I think one metric perhaps we can use is to understand how complete will the recovery be, as in where will activity be at the end of 2022 
compared to the pre-pandemic path. And I think using that as a consistent barometer across countries will tell us about relative performance. And despite these upgraded forecasts from the IMF, they, are, they still believe that you know, two years from now, the global economy will still be four percentage points below its pre-pandemic level of activity, which is not small. I think the second less appreciated uh, pressure point here is just divergences. We're gonna see a lot of divergences in 2021, intertemporally, uh, geographically, uh, sectorally, uh, across factors of production. And I'll just go through each of them to, to lay out what the challenge is. You know, we all expect there to be a handsome recovery this year, but that's gonna be preceded by a lot of pain in the first quarter. We're seeing another mutation of the virus, uh, lockdowns are extending across Europe. Uh, it's hit China as well. So expect a sharp deceleration uh, in global growth uh, to just about 1% in the first quarter. So there's gonna be, you know, it's gonna get darker uh, before dawn. Uh, however, the belief is, you know, this is, a, this is a race between the vaccine and the virus and somewhere around the middle of the year, things will turn around. And then we expect to see a pretty boomy global economy. Our own forecast to JP Morgan has global growth accelerating towards 8% in the middle half of the year, helped by, you know, the vaccine and helped by more stimulus in the US. So expect intertemporally for them to be a lot of differences in 2021. The second is gonna be, I think the most acute will be geographically. We're seeing uh, uh, the recovery at different paces, but I wanna point out what's happening in the US, for example. A, a lot of stimulus that's been added, more stimulus after the Biden administration has come to power. We expect more will happen later in the year. And so you're seeing on the one hand, um, the US prospects are improving uh, by the month. Uh, and yet uh, China has begun to tighten policy already because it was kind of first in, first out. And these geographical uh, uh, you know, differences could result in some pressure points. Typically, you would think you know, a, a strong US economy uh, will, will pull up uh, growth in other countries and we get a more synchronized global recovery. But there is a risk here of US exceptionalism uh, I, I, you know, from the fact that you get a lot of fiscal stimulus but a lot of that is devoted domestically. The spillover effects from stronger US growth are less than in the past, because think of where the stimulus is gonna go. It's gonna go largely to the non-tradable sector, reopening schools, uh, broadening and hastening the vaccination program. If you think of the US consumer and you think of his level of um, consumption at 100 in 2019, December, they've rec he's recovered or she's recovered rapidly on the goods front that level of consumption has gone from 100 to 107. The lag is really on the high contact services, which are at 92. So expect a lot of this stimulus to perhaps be spent domestically on the non-tradable sector. And the reason I'm emphasizing this point is you could then see a very multi-speed global recovery where the US is doing very well, but the spillover effects of that are not as great, especially to Asia, as you typically expect. China begins a policy-induced slowing in the second half of the, of, 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 the, of the year. And if you get this US exceptionalism, there is a risk here that you could get a stronger dollar. Uh, 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 um, and that you know, by itself will potentially tighten uh, global financial conditions uh, for emerging markets. So I think we need to be very mindful about the fact that yes, the global economy will recover, but if it recovers at acutely different speeds, you could have some pulls and pushes uh, based on you know, financial conditions uh, and the dollar in particular. Uh, and India needs to be mindful of that as we move forward. The last point is a more generic point. I think we've all made this in the past. This is looking very much like a K-shaped recovery around the world. You know, profits are recovering uh, faster than, 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 than wages. Uh, capital is recovering uh, faster than, than labor. Um, the upper income spectrum is doing much better uh, than the lower income spectrum. And as I discuss in the context of India, this has implications not just for income inequality, but implications for steady state demand as well, this K-shaped recovery. So I think that's the way we think about the global recovery. Good news ahead of us later in the year, but a lot of divergences that emerging markets will have to be very mindful of. So with that backdrop, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, the news from India, uh, the outset is, is encouraging. Uh, we actually think that um, uh, uh, you know, the, the link between, incredibly so, the link between virus proliferation and mobility uh, you know, has, has, has broken down in India to our advantage. And the numbers are really uh, quite mind boggling. If you look at the cumulative number of deaths in India, 
from the beginning of the pandemic per million, we're about 111 or so at last count. The emerging market average is 260. Developed markets are 980. The US is 1,250. Latin America is 1,000. Emerging Europe, 630. So really we've dodged a bullet in the sense that you know, we, we've escaped the worst outcomes of COVID. And that is showing up in terms of the fear factor abating sooner in the process. Uh, uh, and that I think in conjunction with uh, expectations of uh, you know, stronger government spending in the second half of the year, make us believe that uh, we could perhaps end this year with a contraction of six and a half percent, less than what the IMF has projected at eight, and perhaps even less than what the CSO has projected. We might actually even be surprised by slightly positive growth in the October to December quarter. So that's really, again, the good news. And I think on that base, it's not inconceivable at all for India to grow at 12 or 13% next year in real terms, and therefore nominal GDP could surprise, you know, to the upside at 16 or 17%. So I think that's the good news. We've, you know, we've dodged a bullet on the virus. Uh, the growth recovery is hastened. But again, going back to the metric I used earlier, this will still be an incomplete recovery. Uh, you know, six quarters from now, our sense is the level of output would still be about four to five percentage points below where we would have been pre-pandemic. I think uh, the IMF projects a 9% shortfall. I think we may surprise to the upside. So that is the, that is the good news. Um, I think where I think we need to be vigilant is scarring. Um, that like around the world, we're seeing fair amounts of scarring uh, in the labor market in particular. Um, you know, you look at labor surveys, for example, participation rates have fallen, uh, unemployment has gone up, um, demand for NREGA um, remains, um, uh, uh, remains elevated. All of that tells us that this is a recovery being driven more by profits, much less by labor, much less by wages. And the reason I'm emphasizing this point is um, we know the impact on inequality, but I think it's important to understand that this could also affect steady state consumption and demand. Because you know, I think one of the most insidious elements of COVID economically is it's triggering a relative income shift from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid around the world. And for every dollar that moves from the bottom to the top, you'd expect steady state demand uh, to fall because the propensity to consume at the top, uh, at the margin is lower and the margin propensity to save is actually higher. So apart from inequality, we have to be mindful that you know, when this pent up demand um, gets over over the next few quarters, uh, we need to be very watchful to see can consumption go back to those 7% growth rates that we saw pre-COVID if you have an income hit in the economy, if you have this relative income shift from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid. In the next few quarters, I think expect demand to remain strong. The fact is the upper end has done well. They've had their incomes protected. Savings rates have been forced up. There's fuel in the tank, so to speak. And so as the economy opens up, we will see that pent up demand express itself. My concern is what happens two or three quarters down the line. And, and the reason this matters is um, that if you just go back to thinking of GDP as consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports, uh, for sure we're gonna get a benefit from net exports. It could be rocky, but if the global economy does better, India will eventually participate in that. Consumption, I think, um, remains more questionable for the reasons I mentioned. And I think the key is gonna be how do we stoke the private investment cycle? Because it's only when investment pick up, the jobs are created, uh, uh, that creates uh, incentives for higher consumption and you get into a virtuous cycle. And for me, I think the constraint on investment really is a utilization constraint, that utilization rates are, were below 70% um, be before COVID. Uh, and so until those utilization rates pick up and until demand is more durable, we may not get a big private investment cycle. So the question really is how, um, you know, uh, um, if, if there's uncertain uncertainty on domestic consumption and you get stronger exports, will that be enough for entrepreneurs to start a new investment cycle? Or will they just, you know, uh, wait and watch and, and look through a temporary pickup? And I think the reason I'm saying all that is um, this is where I think the budget has 
you know, an important balancing act. Before I get there, this is not to say there are no tailwinds for India's growth apart from exports. Real interest rates have come down. We're seeing some signs of life in the real estate sector, monetary conditions. So there are clearly some tailwinds, but we've got to contend with this elephant in the room that unless utilization rates don't pick up more sustainably, uh, hard to envision a big pickup in private investment. I think this is where the budget's got to perform this very delicate balancing act. Uh, on the one hand, I, mean, I call it um, an expansionary consolidation. And I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about that and, and then end, uh, Shekhar. I think the expansionary part is we need to make sure that the fiscal impulse is not negative next year. And I define the fiscal impulse as simply being expenditure to GDP. That went up from 12.2% uh, in 2018-19 to 13.2% before the COVID year. In the COVID year, it's gone up to about 15%, in part because the denominator was contracting. Now, the challenge this year is going to be, how do you make sure that expenditure to GDP is not contracting? And with, and with the base picking up with nominal GDP rising by 15%, government spending needs to grow at 15% just to maintain that share. And ideally, given the demand uncertainties I spoke about, you want to increase that share. So you need government spending to grow higher than nominal GDP growth. Now, there may be some skepticism. Do we have the absorptive capacity to execute so much spending? And I'm more hopeful because if you just go back to 2019-20, uh, a pre-COVID year, uh, gov spend, gov central government spending, net of interest, grew at 20%. So we've done this before, and I think we need to do it again. So we really need to see uh, uh, a pickup in expenditure. I would argue a lot of that needs to go into, you know, apart from providing for vaccinations and for things like Enrega, which is the automatic stabilizer we have. I think we need a big push on public investment on physical infrastructure, health, education. You know, this is going to boost demand. Uh, the multiplier effects are very high. This will crowd in private investment. This is job creating. And I think it's only when you create jobs and households have the certainty of that income, will the precautionary savings post-COVID come down? And this improves medium-term competitiveness. So for me, increasing expenditure on infrastructure is, is a win-win-win. Now, the question is, how do you pay for it? Uh, you know, we still end up with a central deficit of about 7% of GDP, our estimate is, and we have to slowly bring that down. Uh, the fact is debt to GDP is going to be about 85% post-COVID. Uh, and I think the immediate imperative is going to be to first stabilize debt at those levels and then gradually bring it down. I don't think we should get overly alarmed by the level. I mean, global debt to GDP will be 100% this year, but I think the trajectory really matters. You know, a, 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 a sufficient condition for debt unsustainability is a rising debt to GDP ratio. So a necessary condition for sustainability is to eventually bring that down. And I'll make two points here. One is we underestimate the importance of medium term growth in debt sustainability. If India were to grow 7% in real terms over the next five years, even if the fiscal consolidation is gradual, debt to GDP will be coming down for the rest of this decade. But if India were to grow at 5% hypothetically for the, for, the, for the next five years, even a sharp fiscal consolidation takes debt to GDP higher right? because the denominator is working against you. And so the balancing act here is how do we ensure that we're reducing the deficit, at the same time, not cutting expenditures that may jeopardize medium-term growth. And I'll end by saying one way of achieving both these objectives, higher expenditure to GDP, but a lower deficit to GDP, so say 7% were to go to 5.5%, is to rely on automatic stabilizers. I think we might be surprised by how, uh, how well tax revenues do, Gross tax to GDP, net of excise, and the corporate tax cuts has fallen by about one and a half percent in the last two years. Uh, buoyancy because reduced buoyancy because of the slowdown. If in fact nominal GDP does go up 15, 16 percent, we could get you know anywhere from 0.8 to one percent of GDP back. So you will get something on taxes, and I would uh, bat as I have been for the last couple of years aggressively for asset sales as well. That if we can deliver another percentage point in asset sales and you get the automatic stabilizer from higher gross tax to GDP, then in fact, both these uh, objectives can be fulfilled. You can bring your deficit down uh, and uh, you can still uh, increase expensive GDP. Uh, uh, and you know, I think if you think of asset sales as a productivity enhancing swap on the public sector balance sheet, we're selling low productive assets, 
to reinvest in health education infrastructure, you can, you can easily justify this as being good you know, corporate governance. Very last point I'll make, uh, um, Shekhar, is just crude prices. We need to keep a close eye on commodities and crude. Um, the excise duties on petroleum and diesel uh, gathered a hefty 0.7% of GDP this year. Uh, 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 and now if crude prices keep going up, then we're faced with a bunch of inconvenient questions. Do we cut those excise duties and suffer a fiscal hit, which complicates the fiscal math? Or do you hold on to these excise duties, but then retail prices keep going up and that impinges on household purchasing power? So it's a delicate balancing act at the best of times, I think more so post COVID, but I think there is a way to both uh, deliver a positive fiscal impulse and therefore support an incipient growth recovery and reduce the headline deficit and therefore not compromise on stability. But I'll stop there. Thank you, Sajid. That was really quite a to the horizon and I think very appropriately, uh, I, I won't betray my own thinking on this though. You and I have talked a lot about this and you've talked about a type one error and a type two error. And in some sense, this is the moment not to worry about overshooting, but worry a lot about under uh, spending and, and, and under stimulating the economy. And I think you precisely laid out the debt dynamics if medium term growth between five and seven percent. And I think Shudipto and, and Bonali's work also very much thinks of the seven percent as an optimistic path. And, you know, even then we don't get to GDP levels of 2019-20 till 26-27. Um, but if we can see great progress on the debt dynamics and the debt to GDP ratio is actually declining, that's a huge achievement. And surely the rating agencies would love that as opposed to, you know, 5% growth. So I think very well said. Let me turn to Sonal Verma from Singapore now and from Nomura. Sonal, your sense of uh, this delicate balancing act and how best can we achieve it? Sure, Shikhar. Uh, you know, Sajid has done a wonderful job in terms of laying uh, sort of both the macro backdrop and the policy priorities uh, and uh, you know completely agree in terms of this being more of an uneven uh, recovery so far um, so i want to touch upon the sort of the policy priorities uh, but a couple of things i want to uh, sort of highlight i think you know even though we are calling this a recovery this is not a recovery i mean you're just normalizing back to pre covid uh, levels so what you've seen so far is normalization this is not a recovery i think you know as we go forward in the next 12 to 18 months yes we should sort of look forward uh, to potentially a cyclical recovery uh, and I think, you know, there are, of course, you know, as Sajid said, a number of factors that uh, could support this, you know, there's the impact of vaccinations, uh, there is the global growth recovery, and, you know, IMF is projecting uh, global uh, trade volumes to pick up uh, both in 2021 and 2022, uh, which is going to support the export cycle and uh, is also going to support the investment cycle. Historically, exports and investment cycles do tend to move in tandem. Uh, and as we do see vaccinations, uh, you know, there will be some moderation in precautionary savings consumption will pick up. So, and, you know, the full impact of the easier financial conditions that we've seen in 2020 uh, has been lost because of uh, COVID and the fear factor. So the impact of the global coordinated, you know, easing of financial conditions along with vaccinations coming on the back of two years of cyclical moderation implies that you're transitioning from a phase of normalization to a phase of cyclical recovery. So that's one. Um, the second aspect is, you know, when we talk about the need for fiscal stimulus and balancing act, you know, I want to re-emphasize, I think the balancing act is not as challenging next year, because, you know, when we are talking about, uh, you know, in our views, close to 17% uh, nominal GDP growth, you know, fairly buoyant asset prices, and therefore the ability to do disinvestment, you can still spend, you know, double digit and do fiscal consolidation. So you are imparting a positive fiscal impulse. So 
I think the uh, you know the fr the framework for assessing whether the growth is whether the budget is growth accretive or not uh, cannot be clearly based on the fiscal deficit to GDP number because you know there'll be a lot of analysis around this after the budget uh, you know has the budget been growth supportive or not I think we need to keep this in mind. Um, so, um, you know, those were the two things on the macro side I wanted to mention. Uh, moving on specifically in terms of what the policy priority should be in the budget, both in terms of this year, but also more in the medium term. Uh, I think, first of all, given the K-shaped and the uneven recovery that Sajid is talking about, and that clearly is true, um, this particular budget, I think, should focus on, you know, what I would call TFF, so targeted. So we don't need an across the board fiscal stimulus. What we need is more targeted support. Now we need additional expenditure on health vaccinations this year. Cannot There cannot be any compromise on that. Uh, the SMEs still need support. The unorganized sector workers still need support, which implies more allocations for the rural uh, employment uh, guarantee uh, scheme, uh, for instance. Uh, and some of the high touch sectors, the you know, tourism, hotels, hospitality, which will be the last ones to recover uh, in this uh, cycle, will still need support. And you know, we can think about how to design the support. You know, it could be in the form of uh, government sharing some of the cost burden for these sectors for a while longer, uh, but more targeted fis uh, fiscal support is what is required uh, in this uh, particular budget. The second aspect of the more medium term scarring effects, I think the um, the true extent of scarring effects, the reality is we don't know. So, you know, we all have a conjecture and I think, you know, the uh, widening inequality because of COVID is a highly likely scenario. But outside of that, uh, I think in terms of the impact on firm bankruptcies, the impact on bank balance sheets, yes, there will be an impact, but to what extent there is an impact, I think we don't know. And the faster pace of economic normalization and the results we've seen from banks in terms of provisioning, et cetera, uh, the collection efficiency we are seeing does seem to suggest that the estimates that were made you know, back in July, August, September, in terms of the impact on the financial sector has been less. Now, like I said, this is an uncertain area. We don't know. It is possible that the moratoriums are leading to delays uh, and will show up significantly in the next 12 to 18 months. Or it's possible that it might be lesser than what we are fearing because the recovery has been faster. So I think we need to keep an open mind on this. I don't think it's a given uh, that you know we are sort of forever scarred. Um, the third aspect I would say is to you know, the reality is that the economy has been facing constraints going into COVID-19. So the pre-existing ailments that we've had, whether or not COVID has, you know, exacerbated them, we need to address them. And those are sort of the immediate constraints on growth, even as we come out of COVID-19 related uncertainty. Uh, one, as Sajid was saying, the corporate sector, you know, we've been in this twin balance sheet problem, which became a triple balance sheet problem, uh, which we still have to deal with. Um, and therefore the ability of the financial sector to fund growth in the medium term remains a question that has to be addressed. Um, the corporate sector, if it continues to focus on deleveraging and what we have seen in the last six months is despite extremely low interest rates, companies are not raising money uh, you know, there is still uh, deleveraging that is going on. And therefore, the point that Sajid said in terms of, you know, capacity utilization being low, who's going to fund CAPEX, and therein comes the need for more public investment uh, uh, going forward. So I think the 
overall balance sheet uh, issues that we still need to address uh, in this particular budget, which are sort of outside of COVID-related targeted support, I would say is the third priority we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, and fourth, and I think if you take a step back, you know, a lot of the things that we discuss, you know, year after year, in terms of what needs to be done, the list has not changed. And so we need to ask ourselves, why do we keep discussing these same issues over and over again? Are we missing certain bread and butter issues which are not getting addressed? And I think a lot of these sort of come under the umbrella of ease of doing business. Now, whether it's you know, tax related simplification, it's having you know, uh, law and order in place, contract enforcement, a lot of these issues uh, which also need to be addressed because, you know, whether you want to, uh, you know, follow an export driven growth strategy or you want to do infrastructure, you know, everything would require this and therefore, you know, in the budget, outside the budget, uh, a lot of these things need to be addressed because it's not enough to, let's say, just allocate X uh, trillion uh, for uh, infrastructure. If you don't address this, uh, you know, it's difficult for the economy to actually move forward. Uh, let me end there, uh, uh, Shekhar. Thank you, Sonal. Um, <clears throat> exceptionally clear four points, uh, and I think things that we uh, I'm sure want to come back to. And um, the uh, I think you're very right to say this is normalization. The recovery is yet to come. And there's a great deal of uncertainty about many of these things. But I do think that uh, the tailwind idea that you wrote about today uh, from global trade volumes going up, um, I, I hope that that's going to be a impetus for uh, the Indian economy as well. And there the competitiveness issues, which of course you ended with on the ease of doing business are going to be paramount. And you know this is just as in uh, thinking about uh, public health, this huge attention to the health of the average citizen is the perfect point to think about health system reform in our country uh, and the role of the private sector, the role of the regulator, the role of the public sector. Much in the same way, I think, for the economy as a whole, this is a real moment of reckoning in some sense. And we could really see this as the silver lining to the cloud where there's real realization that if we do indeed improve our competitiveness through improving the ease of doing business, um, that would add significantly to the recovery as we are going forward. Let me turn to um, Shudipto Mandal, who, uh, of course, is thinking a lot about the deep structural reforms that are needed uh, to allow us to, to regain the growth momentum that we, of course, had already lost somewhat going into COVID. Uh, but uh, he's often talked about 1991 type of reforms that really change the entire psyche uh, of the country uh, and of the investor. But Shudipto, over to you. You're muted. Sorry, Shudipto. I'm going to say mostly muted sentence. Uh, you, you can hear me now, right? Yeah, I was saying that we've just had these two excellent, uh, very comprehensive and detailed presentations by Sajid and Sonal. So that makes uh, my job much easier. Uh, but let me just uh, pick up a focus on a couple of points which was already kind of referred to in what they said. <clears throat> First of all, as we all know, we've had this big dip in Q1 followed by a sharp recovery in Q2, uh, somewhat uh, moderated during Q3 and probably Q4. But we end the year with, uh, you know, between minus seven to minus 8%. I mean, we had said minus 7.3, RBI said minus 7.5, uh, MOSPI said minus 7.7. 7. Now the IMF has said it will be minus 8.8%. So it's more or less in the same ballpark, all within one standard deviation. So everybody's pretty much on the same page. And they're also on the same page that because of uh, this shock, negative shock, you're going to get a boosting effect or a base effect, which will see very strong growth in uh, 2021. But this is just uh, 
you know, uh, uh, the, as I said, the boasting effect, not a real sustained recovery. So again, there are some variations. I would say we'll probably grow at around 10%. Uh, I think I heard Sajid saying they're looking at 12%. We don't know, we are all guessing, but somewhere in that ballpark of certainly double digit <coughs> uh, growth, inflation seems to have moderated somewhat, though the decline in food prices is being offset by some increase in uh, fuel prices, but uh, code inflation also is uh, uh, somewhat moderated. My guess is that in the year uh, going forward, that is 21-22, uh, if there is no negative shock from agriculture, meaning we have a normal monsoon, uh, we will probably be looking at 5% inflation. So uh, nominal growth of say 15% plus minus 1%, somewhere uh, of that. Uh, <clears throat> the question is what you do going forward to sustain uh, that recovery, which will be double digit next year, it's not going to be double digit after that. As Sungal said, we were growing at less than 6% uh, recent trend prior to the co uh, pandemic. And are we going to go back to that or something less than that or something more than that will be very much contingent on what happens in this budget and other reforms uh, uh, along with that. Uh, one, uh, two other points I want to make. Uh, the reference has already been made to this K-shaped recovery in the sense that a lot of the recovery is being driven by higher profits and higher incomes of the upper end of the income distribution pyramid, whereas there's a huge uh, decline in incomes at the base level. So apart from the fact that this has triggered a humanitarian crisis, which needs to be urgently, urgently addressed, it has also meant that our uh, savings propensity has gone up. The multiplier has become weaker, something that uh, several of us have been emphasizing on. And so quite apart from the humanitarian aspect, pure uh, sober macroeconomic management would require you to address and uh, uh, if not reverse, at least to moderate this rising uh, uh, inequality. One final remark on the general backdrop. I think this uh, both uh, uh, Sajid and uh, uh, Sonal also mentioned that given the reduced levels of capacity utilization and the fact that firms are trying to leverage uh, to expect in this prevailing period of uncertainty that suddenly they're going to see some magic wand waving a sharp rise in private investment is very unlikely. And we therefore need to uh, see strong measures on the government side to hopefully uh, crowd in uh, uh, public investment and give a, give a positive shock to public investment, private investment to offset the negative shock of the pandemic so that we can get the private investment cycle uh, going again. Uh, <clears throat> now that is by way of general backdrop coming more specifically to questions of uh, fiscal policy and the budget uh, that is going to be uh, rolled out next uh, Monday. Uh, I just want to say that when we think about fiscal policy, it's important to think that this is only one, I mean, a very important one of several engines that are there to get the economy to function. Uh, so let me get the other engines, so to speak, out the way before I come back to the uh, fiscal question. Uh, first of all, there is the external sector, and uh, Sajid talked about it at great length, Sonal also talked about it. Uh, there are some tailwinds there, some headwinds there on balance. I hope we are going to see headwinds which are going to bump up our export growth. But this is something that is... You mean uh, tailwinds, right? Uh, tailwinds. We're getting our tails and heads mixed up. <laughs> I started this uh, after evening with that mix up. So I think everybody's falling into that trap. No, you do mean tailwinds. <laughs> uh, I mean tailwinds. I also mean headwinds. There are some international tailwinds. There are some international headwinds. The point is that it is beyond our control. What is within our control is how we deal with uh, our export policies, uh, reversing the, the protectionist trends that I've seen in the last three, four years. Uh, uh, sensible uh, exchange rate management so that we don't allow the rupee to keep on appreciating and hurting our export competitiveness and so on. 
but so that's that i'm leaving aside the external sector as one that's to a large extent beyond our control uh, then you have of course uh, uh, monetary policy and here uh, you know the rbi did a lot of heavy lifting all of last year and i think it can do some more of that i have been saying that it should however i recognize that there are limits to that because uh, already it has started going back on this a uh, huge liquidity infusion going back to normal phase uh, beyond the point it strokes up inflationary pressures particularly asset inflation so i think there are limits to what uh, you can do on a monetary uh, policy side uh, and i will come back later to the question of deep deep structural reform but let me before that talk about fiscal policy i think there are two uh, two how should i say two perspectives on this one which i would say is the more optimistic perspective and uh, uh, i suspect uh, that is the sort of perspective sajid has which is that uh, uh, you know uh, buoyancy that is the relationship of uh, revenues to uh, nominal gdp growth typically has been close to one in india but in a post shock negative shock year like we are seeing here Uh, this year the buoyancy might actually rise to more than one in fact if you look at the gst return recoveries in the last few months there's a good promise that we might have higher than one buoyancy which would really mean that revenue would grow faster uh, than the economy and in that case <clears throat> the proposal that sajid is making that if you allow your expenditure public expenditure go a little faster than the nominal gdp growth you may still see a decline in the fiscal deficit and therefore over the over the longer term in the debt gdp ratio now that would be if that were to happen and certainly we can help that with aggressive uh, divestment of uh, of uh, you know uh, public sector assets and i hope this this budget will really give us a, a strong push to that then you could indeed have a situation where you can have strong expenditure growth uh, along with a decline in uh, in deficit a less pessimistic view which i have tended to uh, 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 myself uh, look at is that you do give a strong push to expenditure certainly compared to last year uh, but maybe not higher than the nominal gdp growth rate so you get a slightly lower expenditure growth rate uh, than you have of nominal gdp and i may be wrong but i think i thought sonal was uh, referring to that you know uh, technically there's not much of a difference between the if i if i may put it that with a sajid perspective in mind it may be just a couple of percentage points in terms of expenditure growth rate but uh, analytically there's a big difference it is in one case you have expenditure growing faster uh, than uh, than uh, nominal gdp growth so you get a positive uh, fiscal impulse in the other case you get maybe a small one but nevertheless a somewhat negative impulse and that is what leads me uh, to the uh, uh, the last engine as it were of of uh, uh, deep structural reforms but before i come to that i before i leave fiscal policy i do want to make a couple of uh, points uh one is i already referred to this uh, issue of uh, uh, you know the the need for mobilizing non tax revenues through aggressive uh, uh divestment of public uh, enterprise uh, uh, assets which sajid has been emphasizing but also i think in the expenditure side of the budget we need to focus on two things one is uh, as i said the income support type of programs uh, keeping manrega going in a very powerful way as well as other items of income support like pm kisan and so on so that you try and offset or minimize the negative uh, sort of uh, income inequality effects that we've seen through last year and along with that a strong infrastructure push which again uh, everybody has been emphasizing and for me actually a favorite program i always keep referring to the government program which brings together both the humanitarian type of income support along with strong infrastructure investment is the uh, 
Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. This is probably the most successful infrastructure program we've had since Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee introduced it some, I think, about 20 years ago or so. It has very strong multiplier effects in terms of generating income. It helps the poorest people because they are the ones performing the labor under directly that scheme, or sometimes Manrega has been used to push that scheme. So that kind of infrastructure would be ideal, but you can't always do that. So two planks, one is push up human income support expenditure, and the other is push up uh, 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 infrastructure expenditure. But infrastructure in a broad sense, not just physical infrastructure, but also, of course, and I don't think we have to argue for that. It's obvious to everybody. And I'm expecting that this budget will actually raise uh, infrastructure spending to about 2.5% of GDP or more. Uh, that is center uh, plus states. I think that would be the intention. And that's very welcome. But I hope we don't do it at the cost of expend uh, expenditure on education. So education, health, uh, infrastructure, and uh, physical infrastructure, humanitarian support, these would be the four areas in which I think spending priorities uh, should be focused. Now, <clears throat> having said all this, I don't think conventional uh, fiscal and monetary policy is going to do what it takes. We've had such a big shock that to ensure a recovery, a return to a high growth path of uh, something like 6% or more, let's say 7%, 8%, will take a huge amount of effort and don't think conventional macro policies are going to do it. And that is why I keep emphasizing that we do need strong structural, deep structural reforms of the 1991 type to offset the big negative shock that we just had. And here for limitation of time, I'll just focus on one, uh, namely the uh, financial sector, because as Sonal said, Already before the pandemic hit us, we were on a declining growth path. A lot of it had to do with the, uh, uh, the weakness of the financial sector, the non-performing assets and so on, the uh, multiple ba balance sheet problems. So I think a two-step move on that, certainly first of all, cleaning up uh, the, especially the public sector bank balance sheets, and then thinking of how to recapitalize them if you want to get money into the budget, then you recapitalize by selling public sector equity in these banks. But you could also not sell public equity, but simply raise uh, capital in the market, but to a level that you actually reduce the, the share of the government in public sector banks to, to less than uh, 50% by increasing the capital base, not by selling government assets. And that's another way to go. It's, it's, it's my preferred way, which I've been writing about. But whichever way you do it, I think fixing the financial sector is very, very urgent because I think that's the, the highest risk to uh, systemic risk to macroeconomic stability that we are still facing. We were already facing this before the pandemic and that problem has not gone away. So let me stop there and I hope Usha will pick that up because we are waiting to hear from all on this. Thank you. Well, it's a completely natural segue to what Usha uh, will speak about. Uh, and I don't want to break the flow. I think it's just perfectly natural. Usha, please. Thank you. I only hope this network doesn't let me down. Infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. It's actually, you, you're loud and clear right now. Yeah, I hope it remains that way. <clears throat> well, uh, I think we've ended exactly where I have to start because I remember, you know, Dr. Reddy is known to all of you and he's famous for his quips. And he used to keep saying for every real sector problem, you can't have a financial sector solution. And Sudipto has said, now this is clearly a financial sector problem and that is where the solution lies. I'm not going to quibble with him, but I certainly would like to address this issue. Before I take up the financial sector, I would say that there are significant number of problems in the real sector. And you all know those as well as I do. The interesting thing, however, is that we have, we know quite a few of the problems and we also had quite a lot of experience of the solutions. Now, the demand for credit, like everybody has said before me, was slowing even before the crisis. And this was apparent um, in investment expenditure, low capacity utilization, and the real estate sector had also slowed down considerably. Now, a lot of reform of sectors such as power, real estate, telecom, airline, shipping, these are all very, very critical. 
and we've had a large number of stalled projects which are still stalled and quite a few of them uh, you know have become NPA. Now consumption expenditure like you're all saying which was triggering growth was COVID hit and it is now uh, uh, the, the I mean all that has been explained very well some signs of retail lending picking up everybody has talked about government investment expenditure, expenditure to crowd in private investment and uh, the constraints uh, I mean I think it's very heartening to see that uh, all you panelists feel that there are no I mean there is an opportunity to really spend more on private on, on government public investment expenditure without really uh, you know without threatening the fiscal deficit issues so I think one point we have to understand a lot of the <clears throat> NPAs which have come have also come because of the banks financing the infrastructure sector and this was not uh, it was due to various reasons and one of the reasons was really the execution risk and the regulatory risk and there were huge number of uh, lots of problems addressed in this whole period between 2009 10 up to 2015 16 a number of legal regulatory administrative issues and they did lead to you know potential npa even before project con commencement so i think this is something that one has to clearly uh, uh, you know <clears throat> really what shall i say address in the sense that execution risk has to be minimized and that the only the government can really do it an interesting experiment of course is the kerala one which both shudipta and i are aware of but clear you know where uh, there is a government infrastructure execution and funding in the same organization so uh, let me now not go more into real sector issues but just to say that real sector issues have to be addressed before you know and merely sort of talking about financial sector issues will not work. So the three questions are, can the financial system provide the credit needed for growth? Is there enough capital? Is there enough liquidity? Is there enough, is, are there good governance and management bandwidth for taking and managing risk? The second question is, uh, given the, uh, you know, the banks, the problem banks have faced in infra finance, what will be the source for infra finance? Is the DFI a good answer. The third question is to deal with the problem of NPAs and public sector banks is a bad bank actually a solution and since these all these issues have been talked about I thought it's good to spend some time on each of these. So the first question is whether the financial sector can provide credit for growth, does it have growth capital, liquidity of course I think as and like Shudipto rightly said the heavy lifting was done last year huge amount of liquidity and everyone is confident that even when RBI withdraws the extraordinary liquidity it will kill, still keep a very accommodative stance and it will ensure that overall liquidity to the system does not become a constraint so that leaves these two things of um, capital and risk appetite now uh, very often we say that India's credit to GDP ratio is too low but we have to remember that India, there is a self services sector which has a low, I mean, which is a significant part of the GDP is really service sector and that has a low, lower credit absorption. But there are many segments where credit has not penetrated and the important and interesting issue is really that the share of the public sector banks in the both deposits and credit has really gone down and on an incremental basis. The share of the public sector has become one third and the share of the private sector has become two thirds in the last year. So this is something that, um, you know, in a way, the, sh the sh public sector banks share of the banking system itself is shrinking and clearly something needs to be done to be for them to play their role. So for the public sector banks, if we take, Shudipto has already talked about recapitalization <clears throat> and I think this must be done and obviously the way to do it is to recap bonds. And I think the the banks in which uh, you know this has to be sort of accompanied by uh, by increasing equity from the market. So there's the recapitalization of banks where the the banks are actually a little better, I mean better managed and have got better financials, and make them attractive so that they can actually issue share capital into the market which today they may not be able to issue and realize the kind of fancy values other companies may get. So a careful way of diluting the equity, uh, initial recapitalization and making them ready for reducing their uh, government shareholding. A selective privatization where one offers certain banks in public sector 
in the to the to existing private sector banks or to foreign banks also especially those which have in the past had repeated doses of uh, recapitalization and still they seem to be just draining the government's capital and have not given any returns whatsoever so those are the kind of cases where perhaps one has to look for more uh, a clear offer for sale kind of a thing by uh, you know by promoters who want licenses or for others who want to enter into the banking system the third point would be obviously uh, the whole governance issue and the management issues and not really being uh, you know uh, directed or managed by the ministry and allowing the boards a really uh, you know opportunity to have the kind of autonomy they need to really deal with the various issues which are required for the public sector banks a recapitalized healthy public sector bank to play its role the bank holding company i'm not so sure how that will work again given the kind way in which government manages the financial institutions the command and rule kind of a structure i'm not really very sure but suffice it to say that it is absolutely critical that the reforms that are needed in public sector governance is critical and it does not necessarily have to go along with privatization narasimhan committee said 40 years ago that you reduce your share capital to 33% and keep your critical uh, controlling interest in the banks and manage the board selection of ceo selection of the key management personnel as also the directors this is something that can be done through the board like in any corporate structure and i think that is the way to go forward i mean it's been said before and i think now one just has to act upon it the banks boards will have to be autonomous and the government can have its control bring it down to 51% 50% and bring it down further to 33% i think that is definitely the way to go forward all the banks will have to be brought under the single legislation of the br act and if this government its majority cannot do it which other government can really do it so i think uh, the uh, while uh, you know nbfcs also could be maybe some of those uh, nbfcs which are systemically important could also be one of those banks who one of those organizations could probably acquire one of the failing banks which are really you know really a big problem in the public sector large corporates i certainly feel should continue to be excluded from owning and promoting banks now whether risk appetite can be managed to the i mean for in the psbs it is true that quite a lot of the restructuring has taken i mean quite a lot of the provisioning has taken place and even if one assumes that once the moratorium period is over the fresh uh, provisions that will be required will be quite significant but from what one uh, you know feedback one gets and that's something that you also mentioned the fresh demand for restructuring is limited quite a lot of provisioning has also been done appetite for lending again is coming back maybe that's where this whole business of and i'll address that of the bad bank good bank can be thought of because that will take off the legacy npas from the uh, you know the radar of the banks and they can focus on the using the fresh capital in a much more responsible way with a responsible governance and a management team um <clears throat> i think it's also a fact that in the last uh, you know 6 to 8 months the three c's investigation have not been of the of the virulent kind that was earlier and there is much more confidence in in the banking in the public sector banking system to start lending again in the case of the private sector banks i think growth capital is available and these banks have been lending for mostly for retail and they have taken advantage of the two government schemes that were announced for enhancing credit guarantees but even so even though a fair significant amount of uh, uh, it was envisaged that it would be provided for uh, the msme sector apparently only 50% has been utilized and i think there is a scope for really looking at that why is it the full amount has not been utilized it can trigger back a credit growth into the sector when mobility is coming back all the other factors are favorable maybe it was not one year ago now definitely i think it's something that one has to look at also the export credit scheme there is an export guarantee scheme as well i think these two schemes which government announced last year we should see that they start really working and the credibility that these uh, guarantees will be met without demur and promptly would go a long way in you know uh, giving the support of these schemes to the uh, to the lending to these sectors 
So the MSME sector, the export credit sector, and finally, the we have to talk about the infrastructure. I also feel that while, uh, you know, while we're saying all this, in order that we don't start piling up fresh NPAs, we need to have a clear look at and a detailed study, and I don't think this has really been made available, about the largest NPAs that have emerged over the last 10 years or so. How did they emerge? Where did they emerge? What were the reasons for that? What is a case study? Can we do a really good case study which is transparently disseminated, taking our lessons from that? I personally believe that for the banking system, one really, and for the large NBFCs, we have to have a very intrusive supervision system to continue to ensure that the kind of uh, risk management practices and the kind of uh, uh, gaming the system doesn't happen. Market intelligence needs to be enhanced and, uh, you know, we have to do big data analytics. In the case of NBFCs, I, I don't want to get into the details of the recent discussion paper, but suffice it to say that we have to um, also be able to extend the kind of guarantee schemes to the NBFC sector because they are the sector which actually reach out to the last mile. And it's not just the banks, which so there is a need for those schemes to actually touch the NBFC sector so that they also then start lending to as the recovery is coming back. Resolution of financial institutions needs to be brought back on the table, especially as, as we are looking at some of the problem NBFCs. There are also other issues which, you know, come up and we've dealt with so many times with the systematic systemic uh, impact of liquidity and the need for a the NBFC segment, the LOLR issue is something that directly or indirectly will sooner or later have to be addressed. So let me turn next to the bad bank, good bank issue. There are lots of people very much more learned than me who've talked about it. What are the pros? The pros of setting up a bad bank, it will take out the NPAs from the public sector banks, make them focus on fresh lending. And if the bad bank and preferably it's government the dominantly government owned, then the PSBs would be, you know, it's one hand to the other. So the PSBs would be more confident of taking larger haircuts by transferring the assets at a much lower value as would be offered by the bad bank and their decisions then may not get challenged. Uh, sovereign bank, sovereign guarantee of a bad bank will enable the bad bank to leverage fresh lending while restructuring the viable units. So the real thing that can make a bad bank work is whether it can have a good governance structure and an independent and autonomous, very professional kind of management. The cons, the, I mean, what are the arguments against a bad bank? Some of the things is like that. Mostly bad banks were set when there was sort of a sectoral problem, either the real estate sector or the stock market or something happened. And then when there's recovery, the bad bank then takes over all the assets and gradually, you know, it recovers while it gives a relief to the banks from whom the assets have been taken. In here, the NPAs are really across and maybe, you know, they don't have any collateral. There are real no assets backing them. So ultimately, that may just have to be written off and that will again come back on the government and ultimately the taxpayer. So, but an, another point of view that is being mentioned is that already many pre-COVID NPAs have been recognized and provided for. So <coughs> if you're looking at the bad bank taking over mostly pre-COVID NPAs, then uh, they may not have there not be much. Thirdly, the uh, when the bad bank is operating, then they will have to acquire assets from the same, I mean, assets of the same company from both the public sector banks and the private sector banks. And from the private sector banks, that again, the decision making should not be challenged. That what is the value you've taken from the private sector banks? They have gamed you. They have uh, you know got away with a very good uh, realization. You have not. Uh, you are you know you have to be questioned. So I think these are all the issues that will come again and again, because if we create a financial institution in the public sector, we have to be very conscious of the fact that they have to have autonomy, they have to have good professionalism, they have to have good governance, and we have not been very good at it. So uh, I go to the whole issue of the uh, <clears throat> development financial institution. Again, a new institution, I mean, how can you have, I mean, what, have we been good at promoting new institutions in the public sector and expecting it to work? We have development financial institutions like IIFC, and we have REC, we have PFC, we have IRFC, and all these institutions are public, public sector financial institutions serving the infrastructure. Now, what is the whole idea behind having a new institution for infrastructure lending, a development financial institution? 
we have had so much experience with DFIs in the past and ultimately it's the sovereign, I mean, I think Rakesh has said somewhere, Rakesh Mohan, that why can't the government just issue some bonds as infrastructure bonds and use those bonds really for uh, financing infrastructure? Because, and why add one more layer of intermediary in the, and really the problem in infrastructure is the execution. It's the whole project management. It's the whole clearances, the, the regulatory clearances. All those are things. Money is not really the issue. And have we had very good experience with IIFCL? How many uh, overseas, I mean, nobody wants to come and lend long term in a higher risky infrastructure for a longer period without a government guarantee then government might as well, you know, use some of its borrowing for financing the infrastructure. So I think this uh, argument for a new uh, DFI, frankly, I'm not able to understand that I think we need to deal with the execution risk and uh, the other risks which are there in infrastructure, including the kind of uh, user charges and what can be actually privately financed and what has to be met out of a budget. I think uh, uh, we, uh, uh, setting up new uh, banks and financial institutions, I don't think is really the answer. If we really are looking at a bad bank to help the public sector banks play their role, then we have to be very clear of how it's going to be managed and run. I think I've, that's more or less what I had to say. Thank you, Swan. Uh, thank you, Usha. That's really a very comprehensive uh, view. Um, and I particularly appreciated your going into the pros and cons of the bad bank issue. Um, inevitably, it gets down to how independent will such an institution be? And that kind of leads me to ask, and please chip in whoever wishes to, what's going to be the political economy of this budget? It's going to be looked at very carefully. Uh, everybody's going to want something, and you know, it's not going to be easy to do that. Given where we are and given the politics of our country, uh, and by the way, a, a segue from this question would be, what's the Finance Commission's uh, recommendations going to do to the next two years uh, in terms of center-state relationships, and particularly how the fiscal situation in states is uh, going to play out over the next year, two years, uh, which is going to be quite important. Any one of you wanting to chip in on both the political economy and the politics of this budget, but also then uh, what the Finance Commission will do? And we've got a ex-member of the Finance Commission here. So, Shudipto, do you want to take a crack at it first? Uh, you're muted again, sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, Shekhar. Uh, I don't know what the Finance Commission, 15 Finance Commission, is uh, proposing, but from whatever I can pick up from the press, <clears throat> and I know uh, because I was working with them on a sort of advisory committee to the 15 Finance Commission. And were... uh, Sajid, you too, right? You've also been part of that committee. Yeah, that's right they were very exercised about what to do in this you know the base year that they would have to take for the next they gave a recommendation for the first year and then they had to do it for another five years but obviously the year 2021 cannot serve as a proper base uh, given how abnormal it was so maybe they will look at uh, uh, you know the year 1920 as a base uh, and look at a, if there were no pandemic type of scenario for 2021 and then project it forward. I'm just guessing. But I think they will lay down a path for fiscal consolidation, keeping in mind the big negative shock that we have had. And uh, I think they're also focusing not so much on the fiscal deficit, which has been the tradition, but on what is the impact on the uh, debt to GDP ratio, long-term debt dynamics. Uh, this is also what Sajid was focusing on. And I think they are probably looking at a scenario where they're going to bring uh, a path, glide path to bring down the long-term debt GDP ratio. So that I think will be their stance on the macro question. On the devolution and other grants between center and states, I really don't know. As you know, uh, the 14th Finance Commission raised the devolution share 
from uh, 31 to 41, but it did not increase the net transfer to the states because it reduced the grants. So net net, what was going from the center to the states uh, was still about 61% of the total tax take because we had worked out that the center needed the remaining 39% uh, for its own expenditure on, on central government, on defense, paramilitary forces, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, now I don't know in the, in, the, in the first year's report, they stuck to that 41%, whether they're going to change it or not, I have no idea. I hope they will not. Uh, but what uh, I really hope is that, you know, they do give uh, elbow room to the states because all the public services being provided, certainly in this pandemic, we have seen who is it who's doing the testing and, you know, uh, tracing and so on. Who is it who's going to distribute the vaccine? It's all the state governments. The central government doesn't have any network of its own. It's the states either providing services for their subjects or they're providing services as agents of the central government. So I think empowering the states financially is certainly very important. And in any case, the center always maintains the control partly because any borrowing by the, by the state government has to be approved uh, by not just the RBI, but also by the central government because all these states being indebted to the, to the, uh, to the central government for past debts and for new multilateral debts, which are passed on back to back, they are required by law to get approvals. So that kind of fiscal oversight will remain. So given that, I hope, uh, I hope the finance, 15 finance commission will give elbow room to the states. Uh, this is what I'm hoping. Uh, I don't know what they're actually going to say. Anybody wants to pick up the idea or the question of the politics of this budget? Or whatever that you want. I just follow through on, I think Shudipta made a really important point on the states because, you know, we forget that state expenditure, uh, aggregate state expenditure is higher than the center's expenditure. So when we talk about the fiscal impulse, we're focusing so much on the central fiscal impulse, but if the state fiscal impulse went the other way, it would completely negate what the center is doing. So I want to just double down what Shudipta was saying that if we're thinking about a, you know, gradual fiscal glide path for the center, it will be, I think, equally important to make sure that states have that latitude over the next two, three years. If their deficits end closer to 4% this year or a little bit more, that they have time to go back to their 3% limit and there's no kind of cold turkey approach. Uh, uh, and next year, therefore, even if the center has a positive fiscal impulse, uh, uh, you know, if states have a negative impulse, that will undo it. And giving them that space and time, especially if we talk about capital expenditure, the bulk of capital expenditure happens on state um, on state budgets. And so we need to provide that space. Just a couple of other quick points to reinforce that. One is, I think, uh, you know, coming up with a new fiscal anchor, I think is important to provide certainty to markets. But in the midst of a storm, given the uncertainties, it might be unrealistic to, you know, come up with a new framework at this point in time. I think perhaps in the near term, what's pragmatic is just work with the fiscal imperative, which is for the next few years, just let's make sure debt to GDP stabilizes and begins to come down. The trajectory matters more than the level. And once we're back in some kind of post COVID steady state, we can contemplate a more elaborate framework. The last point I'll make Shekhar is um, the one that was said earlier that, uh, you know, when we talk about fiscal space, uh, debt to GDP is one metric. But the other question is, and this relates to the RBI, that, you know, what happens to actual financing of the deficit? Uh, you know, as Usha Ma'am was saying, if we want more public investment directly on the government's balance sheet through EPC contracts, because that may be the most expeditious way to jumpstart demand and reduce the hysteresis, how will that be financed? You know, whether it's government bonds or infrastructure bonds, they're still drawing from the same pool of savings. And I think here again, the point that Shudipto made is important because if we think about the general equilibrium here, and we believe that there is this income transfer happening from the bottom to the top, all else being equal, that should push up the savings rate in the economy. One of the reasons that the RBI had to monetize much less than anybody thought this year is because private sector savings rose very sharply. Mm -hmm. Some of this was a forced savings in the lockdown. 
The rest was the precautionary savings. And that showed up in the current account. The current account ultimately is nothing but the savings investment gap of the economy. And the fact that we, wrote, we, we, we had a surplus of almost one and a half percent tells us that private sector savings surpluses were higher than the public sector savings deficits. Now, next year, to the extent that you still get a higher, I mean, the savings rate goes up compared to you know, pre-COVID, it may come down compared to last year. If we end up with a current account that's you know, flat uh, and you end up with a balance of payments surplus because there are capital flows, that will still mean all else equal, that there could still be sufficient savings to finance the deficit without the RBI having to you know, uh, uh, overdo any monetary financing or monetization. So I think in a way, all the ducks line up that there is an automatic stabilizer in the economy when you need more public investment, that's also the time the private sector is saving. Those savings rates means their ability to absorb any more debt is slightly higher than in normal times. And that means the, you know, the, the fiscal monetary uh, conundrum could be a little bit less, uh, at least in the first six, seven months of this year, than, than we typically worry about. Sonal? We have a couple of questions. I think we'll have a little bit of time uh, at the end. Meanwhile, if any of you wants to take a look at them, uh, Rajeshwari has yeah. a question. I have, I have, I have uh, seen the questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, before, uh, okay, uh, should we just have Sonal come in first, and then why don't we turn okay. to the questions? Sonal. Uh, Shekhar, hi. Um, no, I think uh, most of the points are broadly covered. I mean, um, I, I think uh, ensuring states have, you know, sufficient funding uh, during this period, particularly in terms of the health expenditure that they need to make is quite important. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, the, uh, the discussion around potentially imposing a cess to collect additional you know, funding is something that would go against sort of the fiscal federalism, uh, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, other than that, uh, broadly, uh, I think uh, one is the more, you know, here and now support that the specific segments of the economy need. Um, the second is from a more medium term perspective, you know, as we were discussing more focus around infrastructure, the incentives in order to make uh, India part of the global value chain, uh, you know, that's sort of the second priority. So you're trying to balance both the COVID related uh, uh, priorities versus the more medium term uh, growth, uh, durable growth uh, strategy. Uh, and I thought, I think third, uh, also from the rating agencies uh, perspective and investors perspective, the question of medium term fiscal consolidation um, you know, it boils down to how credible that path is because, you know, we've had multiple such fiscal consolidation, uh, you know, paths uh, in the past. Uh, and therefore, if we are putting forward a medium term fiscal consolidation path, the way to make it credible would be to have a good revenue generation strategy so that there is greater belief that uh, this path is actually achievable. Otherwise, it sort of becomes more of a mathematical uh, exercise. So I, I think in terms of the macro priorities, uh, you know, these I would say uh, are the key things. Uh, Shekhar, if you allow me, you know, one question I see um, uh, here is in terms of, uh, you know, that and Bornali has uh, partly uh, has, uh, you know, answered that, but the question is around, uh, you know, whether indeed uh, there is a K-shaped recovery given we've seen uh, fairly solid growth across different segments, including, you know, two-wheeler, et cetera. So the question is around, is it really a K-shaped recovery or, or, you know, is it a narrative? Which I think is a fair question. I think it's important. It's very important at this stage to not get lost in the narratives and have a data-driven policy. Uh, but I think to the question of whether it has been a K-shaped uh, recovery, I mean, I think the divergence uh, is clearly visible. Uh, the divergence, you know, between countries, within countries, even if we take the case of India, where, you know, we've seen cost of capital come down, the benefit that larger companies have actually had 
uh, and ability to raise more funding versus the more you know smaller entities have not benefited as much and are still paying quite a lot because of the credit risk perception uh, that banks have reflects the you know have versus uh, have not in the economy similarly the sectors which are able to work from home have access to internet uh, you know would be sectors which employ higher income individuals versus if you're working more in a you know retail trade travel tourism it cannot be a work from uh, home and therefore the impact on the job market has been a lot uh, more uh, segmented similarly the you know monetary policy easing and asset price inflation we have seen has benefited the uh, you know asset owners and the upper uh, uh, income uh, classes so i think the uh, bifurcated impact on you know the haves versus have nots across different segments is very much there uh, but i agree uh, with the basic thrust of the question i think you know like i said we have to be data driven uh, not get lost in uh, narratives uh, at this time of the crisis. But Sonal, you would agree that even with the uh, access to low-cost financing and credit, um, the large listed firms have been kind of deleveraging rather than investing in new capacity, creating jobs and things like that. So you just to add to your point that I think the data does show and Sajid, you had a comparison between two wheelers and four wheelers, right? Uh, four wheelers up by 4% in the last quarter of 2020 and uh, two wheelers down 15% if I'm not mistaken, correct? That's exactly actually that was the point I was going to make that Sona is really important to look at the data, but all the data points point to that. And this is not just true of India, but around the world. So the auto sector is a good one. You know, as you said, passenger vehicle cars up 4%. And look at registration data. I would just urge people who follow this. That's final sales. Otherwise, what you get is, you know, sales to wholesalers, which will account for inventories. It's registration that are re final sales. That was up 4%, two wheelers down 15%. Just look at Enrega demand. Enrega demand in December, there were 26 million households demanding Enrega in December 2020 versus 17 million in the previous December. Look at the labor market surveys, where if you combine labor force part, a fixed labor force participation, the unemployment rate may have gone from 7% to 14%. So this is not to be alarmist. This is what, to be, what you'd expect coming out of a deep shock. This is happening around the world. But we need to be mindful about this because policy needs to anticipate this going forward when crafting the budget. And because of the difference in the marginal propensities to consume, Absolutely. unless you actually uh, you know, make buoyant this class of people and have them consume, we also see some of the data showing that employment has come back, but wages have fallen. And so, you know, that's another marker of this. Usha, let's turn to you. There's some very interesting questions by Rajeshwari. Uh, and I know you want to answer a few of them, including this uh, issue of, uh, well, why don't you go ahead, please. So the first thing which I wanted to mention, continuation of the earlier discussion on the state and center, I wanted to mention about the debt management of the market borrowing program, because the state government market borrowing program was really unprecedented in uh, 2021. And you know that a huge amount of market borrowing, unprecedented amount was put out. There were worries whether that would really push the yields up. But I think the Reserve Bank kind of uh, various ways in which it managed the liquidity, managed the yield curve. I think it has the market borrowing program of this colossal size was put through, like you all said, without that extent of monetization, which one was imagining. Mm -hmm. But clearly the monetary, uh, you know, the, the fact that uh, going forward, the easing of liquidity and the lowering of interest rates much further it coincided with this period when the market borrowing really increased so it's going to be much more tough in the coming year to you know put through the market borrowing program in as uh, smooth a manner as it could have done in the last year and there i would say the state government's uh, borrowing figure would be very very important to see to see that it doesn't really start pushing up the yields, you know, across the yield curve. So I think that's one thing I wanted to mention. The second point was about the IBC and I 100% agree. I think this, there is need to start it again very quickly. I think it has been kept in abeyance because of all these COVID related issues. But I think the IBC has been a very, very important uh, reform mechanism for the country. And this is something that 
as a transparent way of really restructuring and solving uh, insolvent companies. I think this is to really we should get it going, you know, immediately. The third point which uh, Rajeshwari has mentioned about the infra financing and bond markets. Now, what I would really like to say about that is that uh, juxtaposed with the kind of appetite for um, uh, safe and investments which give a reasonable yield, which is there for the entire upper class of people who are making savings in this country today, there is an, I think, an appetite for, um, you know, infra bonds in the savings. Uh, and here, these infra bonds, like we said, could be, you know, issued directly by the government itself or you know one of the existing infra agencies but again i i mean when you get and start looking at the balance sheets of many of these uh, infrastructure development financial institutions like RECP, FC, IRFC, and so on iifcl then the ability to leverage is not that much so i feel that and what you really need are really long-term funding for infrastructure so um i i i think we this ha this point has to be really carefully considered because the bond market development for normal corporate bonds that is there's been a considerable amount of uh, bonds issued in the market and we know the various i mean all of us who are there we know the various constraints in that including the fact that there is a huge crowding out by the sovereign bonds so but in the infra bonds i think there may be need for some fiscal uh, you know, uh, making it a little more fiscally from the tax point of view, making it a little more attractive to really get a good amount of funding for the infra bonds and setting it aside for infrastructure spending and managing the infra execution. I feel that would be a very important thing because this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity because of the savings that are there because of the wealth effect and because of uh, constrained spending in the last year. Um. Rajeshwari has another question which goes to my question about the political economy and a point that uh, Jangi Aziz made the other day that, you know, previous crises have all led to governments needing to pull back and kind of, you know, uh, do the opposite of exactly what's needed now. And so the psyche that's built into the or hardwired into policymakers is, my God, you know, how can we take the risk? We have to keep the powder dry, so to speak. And I think Rajeshwari is also asking the same question that uh, governments have rarely announced the kind of, you know, New Deal moment, as I think Sajid called it the other day. Um, and so might we actually not get to such a thing at all, despite a kind of broad consensus here that, uh, you know, better to... Uh, uh, stimulate more even if there's a certain risk on the fiscal side and the deficit side because you're going to get medium-term growth that will help. Anybody here wanting to take a shot at that? Sonal, yes, please. Shekhar, I mean, you know, the question is, is funding the problem? No. So, you know, because... It's the psyche. You know, seem, no, I'm not even sure it's the psyche problem. I mean, you know, the we I think we have enough in terms of infrastructure projects pipeline to uh, you know do it if we want to. So it boils down to you know execution and the bread and butter issues of you know land acquisition and you know what not. Um, I don't think funding is an issue uh, at all. Uh, you know, as uh, you know, Usha Ma'am was mentioning when households are earning so little on bank deposits, this is the time to be issuing infrastructure bonds and uh, you know, maybe making it tax-free and raising a lot of money. Uh, global funds are looking for uh, high return projects. You can, you know, we don't want uh, one-year debt funding, but we can look at a 10-year, you know, 20-year uh, structure and uh, get in funding. We can raise money in INR from you know, uh, India's, Indians who are abroad. So I don't think funding is the issue. I don't think the pipeline of projects is an issue. If you want to get the growth impulse here and now, there are enough sort of you know, projects, uh, repair and maintenance that can be kick-started if you want to. I think ultimately it boils down to, unfortunately, the boring things uh, that come in the way, uh, which we don't often discuss. Uh, you, I, I'll just make one point. I, I know that uh, you know th there was a lot of fiscal restraint from from April to September, October, but just 
to the extent that the last couple of months are any indication. So we saw in November, for example, uh, central government spending rose almost 50% year on year. Capital expenditure rose a large amount. Uh, December, we don't have the data, but the liquidity numbers in the banking system tell us it was another strong month of government uh, spending. So I'm just taking my cues from there that maybe there was a case to be made that in a during a shutdown, during a lockdown, these fiscal multipliers are sometimes smaller because the supply side cannot respond. And yes, if you spend more when the economy is opening up at some level, that's pro-cyclicality. But to the extent that you, you can elicit a greater supply response, perhaps that was the reason the government was keeping its powder dry. So if November, December, January, any indication, then I would still hold hope that uh, uh, you know we would uh, hope to see more expenditure. I, I, and I think you know announcements apart, the, the, the devil will be in the details. What is that expenditure to GDP ratio? And you know how realistic is the revenue side so that we're not in a situation where we're forced to cut that later in the year. The last point I'll make is, this is where I've been saying asset sales, asset sales, asset sales, because I think in a world with so much global liquidity, right? Uh, 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 you know, uh, sloshing around, looking for yield, uh, this would be the ideal time to look at uh, uh, infrastructure asset recycling. There are no shortage of pension funds who'd want to operate uh, existing Indian infrastructure assets. So I think we can cast our net wide and effort. And I think this will come down, to, this budget will come down to execution. There's a lot of focus on the themes, execution on the revenue side. Can we generate that 1% of GDP in asset sales and execution on the expenditure side, which is the point Sonal made, can we get that 20% growth in spending and can we jumpstart or solve those, mitigate those last mile problems for infrastructure projects? Shikhar, well, may I just make a short Yeah, point? yeah, no, no, I was going to actually turn to you because so there's not just the balancing act, but really at the heart of it is the execution problem. And that gets to the sort of Vijay Kelka Rajay Shah type of issues of state capacity and whether uh, that's something along with uh, Sonal, your point earlier on about the ease of doing business, that this is really a moment for us to think very hard about the resilience of the state and its capacity to actually carry out the pronouncements that it makes. And this is going to be a major issue. Sudipto. Yeah, Shekhar, uh, we are now engaging in, if I may use that analogy, a uh, now casting as opposed to a forecasting exercise because the budget is probably ready to go to the press. I mean, they've already decided what they will do. Uh, but that said, you know, there are two parts to the budget, as we all know. One is the actual arithmetic of the budget. And on that, I could not agree more with what uh, Sajid and Sonia, everybody has said, that uh, we do need to uh, do massive, the, a very aggressive uh, public sector asset uh, sale program because the stock market has been very buoyant. It's a very good time to sell. And that's what the government needs to uh, to get the deficit down, get the expenditure up. I mean, that's the sort of scenario Sajid that talks about. But <clears throat> that's been talked about. Let me put that aside. Come to the announcement effects. You quite correctly re remarked that, uh, 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 you know, very often in a situation of crisis like this, uh, governments tend to go back inside themselves and caution and so on, keeping their powder dry. But that's why I keep referring to 1991. That was a crisis uh, like one we had never had before. Of course, now we've had a worse crisis. And, and in fact, there was a huge political economic crisis, you know, because there was no proper government. And then for a brief period, the Chandrasekhar government came, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Congress government came back with uh, Manmohan Singh as the finance minister. And I think as in a real statesman-like move, statesmanship type of move, uh, they use that crisis very well. And all this has been widely written about now that uh, they went for wide uh, ranging reforms precisely in the moment of crisis when the instinct would have been to, you know, cave, cave in and not do anything and do things in a very cautious way. They didn't. They threw caution to the winds in some sense and did very, very bold moves across trade, tax reform, uh, industrial regulation, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually that really jacked up uh, the Indian economy from that 3% uh, Hindu rate of growth to you know 5% and 6%. And eventually we even touched double digit growth. 
so this is a <laughs> moment like that whether this government has bitten the bullet or not i don't know what is missing of course sunito is the m document right and this is now the mandal document <laughs> the one thing uh, one thing shikhar i really feel is you know the same crisis it was narsimhan committee recommending keep your government uh, control reduce your shareholding let the i think that one thing even if we do it's a big reform for the indian financial absolutely no going I down to 33% i'm not saying you get into privatization no you keep everything we have the capacity we have the people we have the talent it can be done just get off the boards back let them handle the banks and you keep your control over them keep that 33% doesn't matter i mean but i was just reading narsimhan committee again and it was amazing the kind of things they talked about including the investigation and that was why the advisory bank for bank frauds was set up so that they could be protection over the top management and they would take about bona fide decisions other decisions i mean everything has been talk, talked about and thought about and I think this is the time for it yeah i think uh, sudeep to you need to write an op-ed the 1991 moment has come back again uh, because that clearly is the kind of setting that time it was not done it was not done at that time for banking <laughs> no and of course rakesh mohan will say that you know he's not in the crucial position that he was then uh, <laughs> so uh, we are at 8 o'clock just past 8 actually uh, we do want to end on time Uh, I think this has been a fantastic discussion. I do keep thinking that you know we put too much weight on the budget, and really there has to be just a ton of stuff that's done well beyond the budget. So I think we need to have another discussion. I'm going to try and pull all of you in if it's convenient for you to join, as to what didn't get done, and quite frankly, a lot will not just get addressed in the budget. It's too political. It's too highbrow. It's too sort of high profile. but there's a lot of slogging hard work to be done through the course of the next few months and if some of the ideas that we've heard including usha your last one about just you know digging deep into stuff that we already know and we have vast experience and government does not need to give up control but i hope all of these lessons will be with us through the course of this year clearly what is done not just on the 1st of feb but through march april may june july it's going to make a big difference to the next 5 to 7 years and i do believe that uh, shudipto is right that uh, this moment calls for boldness rather than bearishness uh, and i hope that people have been listening to this i want to thank uh, sonal verma chief economist of nomura for india and for asia uh, i always have to say except japan uh, but you know i think it's asia as asia usha thorat deputy governor former deputy governor and a person who has been prolific in her thinking on financial sector reform shri uta mandal distinguished fellow at ncar former member of the 14 finance commission and a whole number of other things and of course sajit chinoy chief economist of jp morgan thank you all for being with us uh, thanks to all our attendees uh, for being such a loyal audience through this evening we really appreciate your being here and we look forward to seeing you again i do want to announce that tomorrow uh, on this channel at ncr we will be hosting the annual cd deshmukh lecture as we know cd deshmukh was the first indian governor of the rbi pre independence also a member of the Bretton Woods commission uh, delegation that uh, was there at the birth of the IMF and the fund and a founding father of NCR and we will have our good friend Geeta Gopinath chief economist to the IMF talking about some of the same issues on a global level and she will talk about how best to avert the kind of divergence that we are seeing and will see in the coming months so do please join us tomorrow at 6:30 with that let me bid you all goodbye and good night stay safe and hope to see you tomorrow thank you very much good night